Don Drinkwalter, who has the patience of a saint, graduated in business administration from the University of Western Ontario in 1958. He has been licensed with London Life and Manufacturer's Life and has since June of 1976 been a principal in the firm of Tomlinson, Bowden, Brooks, Drinkwalter, Polchi, and Crofts. He is a member and has for four years been a member of the board of directors of the Life Underwriters Association of Canada, a member of that association's taxation and legislation committee, a member of the Estate Planning Council of Toronto, and a lecturer and seminar leader in the Bar Admission Course, seminar leader since 1974, lecturer since 1977. Mr. Don drink water. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I thank you for your kind invitation to appear here today. I wonder about being middle in the program. Wolf Goodman talked this morning about deferred income plans, RRSPs and DPSPs. Take five minutes out of my talk. John Fuke discussed income planning, tax shelters, children's trust, and deferred annuities. Take another five. <clears throat> Jim Kennedy is covering buy-sell agreements and the technicalities of corporate-owned and corporate redemption and capital dividend payouts. Delete another ten. Jim Wardlaw is dealing with family business interest. Delete another five. So I'm going to be right about on time here. Some of my friends in the audience have accused me of poor organization. They said in their kits there were no prearranged applications for life insurance, no self-addressed return envelopes. <laughs> However, since the head can only absorb what the bottom can endure, it'll be brief. I am not going to go into great technical detail of certain areas. I am instead going to try and highlight things which I think will be of interest to you, things that are new and different and the areas that I hope you're going to be more involved in in the planning and uses of life insurance. First of all, the topic of the use of life insurance since the repeal of the Ontario Succession Duty Act and the Gift Tax Act, what effect is this going to have? As far as the insurance industry is concerned, it'll be nominal, if at all. Based on the experience of the province of Alberta when they went out of the succession duty business, they didn't even stop for breath in the purchase of life insurance. Now, we hear staggering figures of $333 billions of dollars of life insurance in force in this country, and it sounds like a lot of money. But let's put that into perspective. If the total amount of life insurance owned at the end of 1978 was divided equally among every man, woman, and child in this country, we would each have $14,100 worth of protection. In the province of Ontario, it works out to be $15,000 per head. The immediate effect, as we see it, and in our personal experience, is that we've probably got a situation now, without succession duties, where there's more flexibility in the use of the life insurance product. Since taxes are taxes, and the long-term effect due to inflation, the influence that that is going to have on the capital gains taxes, It'll undoubtedly mean that more life insurance is to be purchased for the payment of those taxes and not less. <laughs> With the propensity of our governments to spend money that we haven't even borrowed yet, we may be experiencing a calm between two storms. The first storm is the repeal. The next one is how long will capital gains tax satisfy the appetite of the tax collector? That's a good point for speculation. How long until the next government will institute some form of wealth taxation? Wish we had the answer to that one. So long as people have dependents, they'll need life insurance. As long as they die too soon, become disabled, or live too long. Now, the traditional markets are not going to change. They're going to expand. The creation of estates where none existed before those estates must be larger due to inflation. The collateral term insurance requirement. In our society, to destroy your credit rating destroys your credibility. A loan shouldn't last any longer than the man who created it. When a businessman needs cash to run his company, he signs twice at the lending institution. 
First, he signs to provide corporate guarantees, and secondly, he signs providing personal guarantees. In the event of his death, the bank stands in line ahead of his family. Life insurance owned by the company on the life of a key executive, shareholder, or officer can guarantee that that widow and the dependent children will have their interests reinstated and their proper priority with their husband will come back in proper line. Now, the guidelines at the present time have been modified through the IT Bulletin 309R. Basically, the insurance must be on the life of an officer or shareholder. It must be term insurance. It doesn't need to be a new contract. It can be an established policy. The lender must have the policy assigned to him, and the amount must be reasonable in terms of the amount of the loan. Now, the one thing that, that introduced a cloud towards the deductibility of the cost of this life insurance was paragraph 7 in this bulletin. In considering the reasonableness of the deduction, the amount of the coverage provided by the policy compared with the amount of the borrowing outstanding at any particular time is taken into account as well as the value, and here are the catchwords, as well as the value of the other collateral held by the lender. If the borrower were to default on a particular loan and it is evident that the lender could realize the full amount outstanding by exercising his rights over the other collateral, no portion of the premium cost is considered to be a reasonable expense of borrowing. Now, I don't know how you evaluate that one as you go along, but I think there are very good reasons for the life insurance to be put in force and to be assigned, whether or not the premiums are deductible. The deductibility is merely the icing. The life insurance in the event of death is the cake. In the area of funding of buy-sell agreements, most often the surviving business owner's interests and those of the deceased's heirs are in direct conflict. The deceased's estate understandably wishes maximum income for the widow and the dependents to pay for food, clothing, and shelter. And generally the largest share of the deceased's estate is tied up in that business. The surviving shareholders, on the other hand, most often desire growth to capture new opportunities through reinvesting of profits in inventory, accounts receivable, and bricks and mortar. Jim Kennedy, as I mentioned, will be discussing the various arrangements for funding, corporate-owned insurance, whether to use the corporate redemption or the outflow of the capital dividend account to put the funds in the hands of the the people you want them to ultimately get to. So I'll restrict my comments to talk about the product. First of all, term insurance. Level protection on a guaranteed renewable and convertible basis. And I emphasize both of those two points. It's low cost today. It solves a need. It's a very valuable piece of property. It may be no bargain in the long run if your shareholders are older, if the intent of the shareholders is to retain that business interest, if the intent is ultimately to bring in children where the life insurance may be necessary to be retained in force to pay capital gains tax on the ultimate disposition of those shares at debt. If the business is a new business and it's heavily in encumbered by debt, it may be impossible to do anything but buy term insurance. Therefore, it must be renewable and it must be convertible. Permanent insurance, whether it be ordinary life or whole life, pays the face amount at death whenever that is and may, in the long term, have a real need in the situation. Again, there is no one ideal solution. The solution in any particular situation is going to depend on the factors in that particular situation and the objectives of the owners. There's joint life, multi-life, or contingent life policies that are available. Basically, what you're doing is you're insuring several lives with the payment to be made on the first death or the second death, however the structure should be to set it up. In some situations we've encountered, the money was not required on the first death. They felt they could weather that storm. But in the event of a common disaster or on the second death, they have serious financial problems. Now, if the insurance through one of these arrangements is payable on the first death, I would like to suggest that 
you be sure that the policy contains provisions for continued insurance on a guaranteed basis for the survivors without the problem of the underwriting process. Let us not forget that we're dealing with people at a highly emotional period. One of the partners has just died. Potentially, there could be no insurance in force to fund any continuing agreement. So we feel that this guaranteed continuity of insurance coverage for survivors is a must. Split dollar insurance. Split dollar insurance is being used to fund buy-sell agreements in situations where the company is in a lower tax bracket than the individual shareholders. The shareholders pay premiums in the early years for the risk element of the policy. The corporation contributes the reserves or cash value portion of the premium. After a few years, depending on the ages of your insureds, the owner shareholders portion of the premium is reduced substantially and may disappear entirely. Now, it is being used, and I believe in the proper circumstances, it's a very viable solution to the problem. There is some concern by accountants that Revenue Canada may claim a conferred taxable benefit under the Income Tax Act Section 61A or 151A. I am not aware that that has ever been done. Revenue Canada has avoided giving rulings on it, and in one instance that we're aware of, a local assessor wished to, to tax a benefit under that. The insurance company got prepared to go and defend the situation, and they received a call saying, forget it, we've been told by Ottawa not to bother. What's going to happen in the future, we don't know. Disability buyout insurance. This is something that I don't think is clearly known about or understood. It is expected in our shareholder agreements that we encounter that some form of income replacement contracts will be in force to provide income to any of the principals in the event of disability. That's fine. That frees the corporation from the problems of continuing income. But what about the buyout of the shareholder? When should that be triggered? And from whence cometh the funds? The buyout insurance in the event of disability is available in, on one of two bases. One is a lump sum buyout. The second is payable as income over a period of time. The lump sum buyout is available once a doctor certifies that you are totally and permanently disabled. The insurance company guarantees to pay those funds within seven days. Now, as an example, take two dentists in partnership. They have heavy investment in capital equipment and in premises. One dentist loses a hand in an automobile accident. He is totally and permanently disabled from his practice of dentistry. Within seven days, capital will be paid so that he can be bought out. If he has a good personal disability income, income replacement contract that guarantees his income as a dentist, he will have income to age 65 plus his capital from the shares that, that have been bought out. The cost of this is subject, of course, to age and insurability, but you're looking at approximately 6%. Now, the, the buyout over a period of time, this type of coverage carries with it a waiting period of either 12 months or 24 months or 36 months. You can custom tailor that within reasonable limits, but basically the higher the amount of the buyout you require, the longer the waiting period the insurance company requires. Because in the event that your insured comes back off disability, the payments stop. The maximum amount available on any one life for this type of coverage is $250,000 at the moment. The maximum we've been able to find on the lump sum buyout is a million dollars. Now, what about provisions for future growth? Growth in an expanding business or growth due simply to inflation? Now, there's no easy answer and everyone's concerned about it, but it seems that we're locked into an inflationary economy. And therefore, it would seem prudent to do something in our planning to provide for increased payouts 10, 15, 20 years down the line. There are 
two or three things that we think you can do. One is take an option on tomorrow through a future purchase option, which guarantees the right of the owners of that contract to double up the amount of coverage at predetermined times. It's the guaranteed insurance option in jumbo amounts, custom tailored to fit the needs of that particular situation. In one instance we were involved in, the, the company was fairly well established. They thought that in five years' time, the company would double in value, and in another five years' time, it would double again. So we were able to provide options which would double the insurance coverage each five years. We were exposed in another situation, which is very current, with a company that's growing extremely rapidly. The, the 1980 value is $2 million, and we have four shareholders. They're age 37 to 41. They're estimating that in five years, that in eight years' time, that company should be worth $10 million. Now, that's pretty significant growth. We were able to find for them an insurance company that would design a product which would allow them to double their partnership insurance each two years for the next eight. So the net effect is that each individual has the option to add another half million dollars worth of coverage every four years, or every two years, with four options available. Now, the cost obviously depends upon age and insurability of the people going in. But at, at age 40, you're looking at about $6 a thousand to guarantee that right. With the, uh, the pressure on health and the speed that these people are working, that may turn out to be a, one of the biggest bargains in the country. Secondly, you can overbuy now on a term insurance basis. And this is something that's only going to, to prove with the ages of your people and their insurability. It may prove more prudent to double the insurance now or triple it now and stockpile it in the company and sell it out at a later date based on the cost of the options and the cost of the term insurance. A third alternative in a, a more well-established company that isn't growing quite as rapidly and are doing more long-term planning, the use of a permanent life insurance contract issued on a participating basis with the dividends applied to the fifth dividend option. For example, with a male age 40 with a $100,000 risk, the insurance premium is approximately 2%. In 10 years' time, the coverage would have increased by 21%. In 20 years' time, by 61%, and in 30 years' time, it's, it's doubled. If half of you people walk out, I'll assume you have the blue luncheon tickets. <laughs> now, how do we plan for capital gains tax liability? Cash via life insurance contracts to pay capital gains tax on assets that the testator wishes to pass to his heirs. For example, a real estate investment. A man can leave it to his spouse and affect the rollover and the deferral of the taxation until her death, at which time it's assumed she will leave it to the children. It's possible to structure a life insurance policy which would be payable on the second death when the cash would be needed to pay the tax of that capital gains tax and retain the asset for the second generation. I would suggest the use here of, of a life insurance trust, particularly if the children are dependent, so that the cash can be loaned from the trust to the estate to purchase the asset and affect the transaction that way. Now, passing down of small bus business interests from one generation to the next Jim Wardlaw is going to discuss this in greater detail tomorrow. But basically, you've got the first $200,000 of gain, which can be passed tax-free, either on an inter vivos or a testamentary transfer. Revenue Canada has made some changes in administrative procedures relative to charitable donations for life insurance premiums, which I think is an area that 
is going to expand the opportunities for charitable donations. Basically, what they've done is they've simplified the procedure for an individual to give money and simplified the administration from the charity's point of view. Interpretation Bulletin 244R allows a taxpayer paying premiums on a life insurance policy on his life with the charity as the beneficiary to make those premium payments directly now instead of having to make the donation to the charity, then have the charity turn around and pay the life insurance premium. From a strictly practical point of view, this is terrific. What happens if you are working for the charity and the donor of a million dollar life insurance policy hasn't made his contribution this year and you've got to pay the life insurance premium? It puts you in an awkward situation to call him and say, hey, we need your money to keep the insurance in force. And he said, I'm sorry, I'm dying of cancer. You know? So the simplification of this allows the insurance company to approach him directly and collect the premium. The use of life insurance in estate balancing. <clears throat> now, this is a situation which I think Jim Wardlaw is going to discuss briefly tomorrow. But take the situation of a business owner who has two children, one of whom wants to and is capable of getting involved in the business, the other who wants to be an archaeologist. Is it fair on father's death to leave 50% of that thriving business entity to each of two children, one of whom who has no interest whatsoever in the problems or the fun or the the thrills of running the business, and then leave mother dependent as well on dividend income for her survival. A properly arranged life insurance contract owned by the daughter on the life of the father may provide the daughter with sufficient cash in a situation like that to buy the other half of the business from brother and she can continue it on. See, I'm not a sexist. We've seen too many good family businesses run into the ground because one heir does all the work and bears all the responsibility while having to answer to non-involved shareholders who don't understand the business, they don't know what its problems are, and they really don't care. All they really understand is that the one who's operating the business is buying Mercedes-Benz and vacationing in Hawaii and skiing in Switzerland, and where the hell are the dividends? Well, I'm sorry the cost of the loan went up and there are no dividends. One situation that, that we encounter in this is a, a classic example, a farmer who had a very successful dairy operation. He had two children, both sons, a son who wanted to run the operation and wanted to continue to do so and was capable of doing so. The solution that, that was presented in that case was for father at his death to leave the, the one son the ongoing dairy operation with a value of roughly half a million dollars, and to the other son, leave him a mortgage for $250,000. Now, life insurance is going to be paid for by someone. In that situation, son is, who inherits the farm is going to end up paying off a $250,000 mortgage, repayment of, of principal, after tax, repayment of interest, tax deductible. We think that the organization of a properly structured life insurance policy on father's life, funded through gifts while father is alive, might provide a heck of a lot cheaper solution to that problem and leave two happy sons who can still relate to one another and live happily and get along in the future. So we think that a careful analysis and a thorough discussion of the problem may show that li the life insurance route is undoubtedly the cheapest method of paying those transfer costs. <coughs> Income averaging annuities. There are some contractual conditions which we think are far more important than the last few dollars of monthly income in a competitive situation between carriers of these contracts. The client's circumstances change. Anything we recommend should be examined in the light of those possible changes. Is he going to leave the country? Is he going to remain a Canadian taxpayer and a resident? Is he a risk taker? Is he in a potential situation of going broke? The right to alter that contract in the future in light of those potential changes is the most important feature. 
does that contract allow for a partial or total commutation of the policy and at what cost? In situations where the determination of the amount of qualifying income is dependent upon valuation, and Ian Campbell is going to talk about that this afternoon, or where an interpretation is not free from doubt, Revenue Canada is prepared to retroactively accept as an income averaging annuity contract an otherwise ordinary annuity contract which meets the definition of the paragraph 614B. Now, provided that it was purchased within the year or within 60 days of year end in which the qualifying income arose and provides that the annuitant submits the issuer's certificate and can, as described in the information circular. Now, if the annuity has not been purchased at the time and or within the year of the triggering of that gain, the right to forward average that yet to be determined gain has been lost forever. If the annuity is not required, the annuitant can simply continue it on as an ordinary life annuity, or he can commute it and get his money back. We think it's something that should be considered, particularly in the share, sale of shares of Canadian-controlled private corporations. Now, what about the money that's borrowed to purchase an income averaging annuity. Where a taxpayer borrows those funds, the interest is considered paid on money borrowed for the purposes of earning income and is deductible. Now, there is a current campaign on this year by the, the trust companies to issue loans up to approximately 90% of the amount of the purchase price of the annuity with a 2% spread between the loan interest rate and the interest rate provided on the annuity. Now, we think those situations should be looked into beyond the surface because several of those trust companies deny the, the annuitant the privilege of paying off that loan. It's a locked-in loan for the duration of the annuity. Or secondly, if they do allow the payoff of that loan, they want to also have the right to collapse the annuity. Now, if you believe that there's a cyclical history to the rates of interest, and that we're at a peak and they will be going down, it would be a damn shame, in my humble opinion, to lock people in at a 6% interest, 16% interest rate on a substantial loan, giving them no right to pay it off when money becomes cheaper down the line. Annuities are assignable as security if properly done, assigning the payments rather than an, an outright assignment of the contract itself. We think the, the flexibility of the annuity contract is important because if, if part or all of the qualifying income which was used for the purchase of that annuity subsequently becomes disallowed, the client should not be locked into a contract that doesn't allow him the right to escape. In retirement planning, client, take a real situation that we experience. Client age 65, wife age 63, is retiring at the end of 20 years of continuous service from a major corporation. He has a benefit under the pension plan that'll pay him 2% a year for the, excuse me, the 30 years of continuous service, or a 60% average income for the best and last five years. It sounds like a super pension plan. His average income was $70,000 a year. He's gonna retire on an annuity or a pension income of $42,000 a year. But looking beneath the surface, it turns out that that's a $42,000 a year pension with a five-year guarantee. So that if he dies prior to or shortly after age 70, his widow, who is then about 68, has no continuing income from that plan. One possible solution is the purchase of a joint and last survivor annuity, no guarantee, to maximize the amount of income. Because of the age difference of two years between husband and wife, they were both in good health, the amount of the annuity income reduces from $42,000 a year to $38,000 a year. What price to provide capital on an ongoing income to the widow? The reduction in pension income of $8,000 per year 
at a period in a man's life when he has no way of supplementing that income or having it grow is an extreme premium to be paying for lack of capital. It's quite possible that the purchase of a single premium life insurance contract with funds that may be available through the, the freeing up of the sale of the home to move into a, a smaller paid for condominium might provide capital which would offset and minimize the need to reduce that pension income. Now we're, we have run out of time and there are several things that I know Terry Sweeney covered and some of the other people will be, be covering. Deferred annuities have been mentioned. In summary, I would just like to say that good estate planning has always been done to accomplish the objectives of the estate owner with a secondary view to minimizing the transfer costs. On the whole, the revocation of succession duties in the Gift Tax Act, while reducing the transfer cost of the assets involved, will have very little to do with the amount of life insurance that will be purchased. Like good estate planning, good life insurance planning started before death duties had a serious impact and will continue long after the demise of the death duty legislation. We think capital gains tax will more than replace it. Thank you very much.